Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher, and today we are going to be talking about some of the basics of open theism. Open theism on its face is an attempt to reclaim the God of the Bible, reclaim the God of Jewish theology, and divest Christianity from the pagan influences that influenced Christianity very early on in Christianity's infancy. So pagan theology at the time of Christ especially in the Greek world, was very platonic. They were obsessed with the ideas of Plato, where God is this infinite good that's uh, utterly unchangeable and very transcendent from the world. And this is in stark contrast to the Jewish concept of God, where God is Yahweh. God is Yahweh in the Bible, and God's primary purpose in the Bible is he's, he's personal, and he's relational, and he attempts to influence and direct and guide Israel. And the entire story of the Old Testament is, is God struggles with Israel. God keeps trying to form them and mold them, and they keep rejecting him. They keep rebelling. So this pagan influence in Christianity is well documented. It's not really debated among critical scholarship, people who aren't hardcore evangelicals trying to you know, try to press their private agendas where, you know, Platonism is compatible with Christianity, that evangelical world. Secular scholarship and non-Christian scholarship all agree that, you know, Christianity adopted a lot of these concepts from Platonism. And we could actually show how that influenced the church. We could show the progression of how various teachers in the church were influenced by this platonic thought and we see their rejection of the bible and how they transpose the bible with this theology that is uh, not kosher to jewish religion and incompatible really with basic jewish thought this issue is really a subject of a different podcast one which goes in depth in the how the transmission and the influence of platonism and how it really affected Christianity. But suffice to say that the Platonic attributes soon became standardized in the Christian church, and among those is the idea of omniscience and and timelessness, that God's in some sort of ethereal other world, and he kind of sees all of history all at once. And by and large, open theism rejects that concept. The philosophical open theists reject it for philosophical reasons, but the biblical open theists try to point to the Bible, try to point to the story of the Bible to do so. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of the Bible and how the Bible presents God. In Genesis 1, you see something very interesting. God is creating the universe. What God does is he creates and then he looks and he sees and then it's good. There's this creation and evaluation, creation, evaluation, creation, evaluation. This, this is a repeated theme in the text, and always it is good. God is creating a good universe. As in pagan theology, the universe is a mix of evil. You know, there's, there's evil inherent in the system. But in the Christian religion, in the Jewish religion, the universe started out good. And what corrupts the universe is sin. When we first see Cain, Cain is being presented with sin, and God tells him about sin. He says, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you. So you really need to overcome this sin. Man always had a choice. This is God, and he is presenting man with a choice. Either serve sin or serve me. You notice the free will in the text. The text is not fatalist. The text doesn't believe that mankind has no option to choose or not choose God or he needs some sort of redemptive act in order to choose God. Man can choose good. Man has free will to choose. There's not this chasm. There's not this pagan notion that we are utterly corrupt, that the material world has fallen. No, the material world is good and man can choose good. So back to Genesis. God creates the universe and what's the first thing he does? He first creates man in his image. And this is unique because in pagan theology, pagan religions, man was just some sort of weird clay servant or something like that. He was a menial. He was unimportant. But in the Jewish religion and Christianity, man is in God's image. And that word for image is the same word used for idols in the Bible. So as idols are to the pagan gods, mankind is to God. 
We don't need idols because we are the image of God. We are the representation of God. And being the representation of God, we have value. So God creates man in his own image, and he's never really interacted with man. He doesn't quite know exactly what man's going to do. He's still in this phase of curiosity. So the first action God does is he brings the animals to Adam. And the text says explicitly to see what he would call them. So God is trying to look to see how man's going to react with uh, this stimuli. He's watching. It's, it's a new creation. He's curious. And that's, that's really the sense you get from this. So fast forward to the fall. God has put man in this beautiful garden, and all his needs are met. And God only gives him one rule. And this rule is not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God tells them that if they do eat of this tree, they, they are going to be killed. He's going to kill them both. And the serpent says to them, no, that's not really true. Once you eat of this tree, you're going to have the knowledge of God. And what happens? They eat of the tree. They do gain the knowledge of God. And God, it seems that he took an act of mercy. He did not kill them. And what he does instead is he expels them from the garden. So man's first fall, man's first rebellion, God didn't seem to fulfill his promise to them, his promised punishment for their actions. He took mercy on his new creation, his creation which, which he loved, which he was very curious about, and now which had failed him. God continues like this. You don't really get a sense of anger. And even in Genesis 6, God has, is viewing the world. And it says uh, he sees the world and the world has corrupted itself. The entire world has become evil. And you still don't get the sense of anger in God. But you do get a good sense of regret. So God loves people. God loves his creation. God loves his image. And here they are, his new creation, which he expected to be great and which he expected to be in communion with and which he expected to love him and be fruitful and multiply and, and really do good things. And they've all failed him. They've all become corrupt. And he, he gets a sense of sadness, a sense of regret. And he says, I regret making man. So God's act of regret, it's not an isolated feeling. God acts on this regret, and he says, I'm going to just destroy everything. I'm going to kill it all. All the flesh, uh, even the animals, I'm going to kill the trees, anything. Everything is going to die. But then something in the text happens, and it says that Noah, and Noah's a man, and Noah finds favor in the eyes of God. And the eyes of God could be a metaphor for God's angels, which you kind of see that sense throughout the Bible. So maybe there's an angel that particularly favors Noah and and talks to God about it in favor of Noah. If, if it's not metaphorical for an angel, then Noah directly appeals to God in some sense. And God decides not to destroy the world completely like he had resolved to do. So God ends up saving Noah, and Noah saves himself, kind of, because Noah's the one building the ark to save himself. If he rejected God, if he didn't believe God, he would surely be dead. But him and his family, and it's interesting his family's not mentioned until Noah gets to save him through Noah's own salvation. His family wasn't being saved for their sake, they were being saved for Noah's sake. And so Noah builds an ark, saves his family, and then after the flood subsides, God looks again and says, you know what, I destroyed the world because the world was evil and the world was wicked. But now I kind of get the sense that mankind is not going to change. They're always going to be evil. They're going to be evil from their youth. And I'm just going to let it ride out. I'm not going to destroy the earth again for this reason. So you really see in this text that God is learning about his creation. God is learning about man, what they're capable of. And God really kind of conforms to mankind rather than forcing mankind to conform to him. From this point, God really changes his game plan. Before he was trying to reach the entire world. He's trying to go out and, you know, make friends with everyone and commune with everyone. But after the fall, after the flood, he seeks out one specific individual, and that individual is Abraham. So God gives Abraham a unilateral promise, and this unilateral Susan's covenant is that Abraham will be the father of many nations, and from him the entire world is going to be blessed. And this is a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible that you see invoked from time to time. And whenever God in the future is planning on destroying Israel or cutting Israel all off, or even when the Jews are contemplating how God's going to handle them. It's always with reference to this unilateral covenant 
this covenant that cannot fail. And God, throughout the Bible, talks about different contingency plans, how he can make this covenant come to pass, even if all of Israel rejects him. John the Baptist says, you know, even if everyone rejects God, God can make new children of Abraham to fulfill this unilateral promise, this promise that the entire Jewish world knew about and relied upon. So you really don't get the sense that this promise is a promise that's only fulfilled through God's uh, forcing everything to happen or dictating everything or, or even God's knowledge of the future. You get a real sense that God can innovate. God can figure out how to make things work, even in light of changing and difficult circumstances. So God really likes Abraham. And one way we know this is in Genesis 18, God invites Abraham into his divine counsel. He invites Abraham to weigh in on his decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And you, you get the sense that when God is talking about why he's inviting Abraham in, that he expects great things from Abraham and Abraham's descendants. He says, I know Abraham serves me, so his children are. But did that necessarily happen? Not if you read the Bible. A lot of times Israel is completely and utterly rejecting God. And God did not expect this, especially coming from Abraham's descendants. This was a new change. But God himself really loved Abraham, really loved Abraham, enough to, even in spite of Israel's continued rebellion in the future, to honor this promise. So in Genesis 18, Abraham weighs in on the decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Those were very wicked cities, but Abraham told God that, you know, depending on the amount of righteous people, it might the collateral damage against the righteous might be too great for the city. You're not going to just destroy an entire city just to kill a bunch of wicked, but then you're also killing some really good guys in the process. And so they have this negotiation about numbers where Abraham keeps continually trying to lower God's numbers of the righteous people that are going to be found in this city. And God accepts this, and God values Abraham's opinions, and he values Abraham's inputs. It turns out there's only one righteous family that's in Sodom, and that family is extracted before the city is destroyed. So Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has Joseph, and the twelve tribes of Israel. The Israelite nation becomes enslaved eventually to Egypt. And then a new hero arises, and this is an unlikely hero, and you don't get a sense from the text that he's particularly God-fearing. In fact, he tries to ignore God's calls to be a prophet, and he tries to figure out excuses to get out of it. And this, this individual is named Moses, and Moses is a reluctant, and Moses doesn't want to do God's will, but God continually talks to him and tries to convince him into it. One very interesting thing about the text is Moses is concerned that Israel won't believe him. They will not accept him as a prophet of Yahweh. And Yahweh's name is basically unknown to the Jews at this point. So so he doesn't even have a legitimate name to stand behind. And God promises all these series of cascading contingency plans, how to get the people to believe him. He gives them, says, if this sign doesn't work, then do this sign. If that doesn't work, then do this. If that doesn't work, then do this. And Moses has to go, and he brings his brother Aaron, who's also a compromise in the text, and they perform these signs to Israel, and Israel still does not believe. In Israel, they oppose Moses throughout Moses' ministry, and they oppose Moses' plans, and every time Moses causes more hardships for them, they give him a hard time. So God's attempts to reach Israel, even his cascading contingency plan, it kind of falls flat. And Moses has to go it alone, alone with God's help. And eventually Moses is able to bring Israel out of Egypt. And he brings them to Mount Sinai. The Mount Sinai text is very interesting, and I suggest everyone reads the entire event from the time that Israel gets there to the time Israel leaves. But one such event on Mount Sinai is when Israel, down below, they continue their pattern of disbelief and resistance to God, and and they create this golden calf. And they worship this calf as the God that brought them out of Israel. And God's looking down on this, and God is furious, and he wants to destroy all of Israel. And Moses hearkens back to God's unilateral promise to Abraham. He says, you know, you you could kill these guys, but, you know, you promised to make them a good nation. And God wanted to use Moses as the conduit for fulfilling that promise. He says, I'm going to kill them all, and then I'm going to fulfill my promise to Abraham through you. But Moses is not interested. Moses wants this people to be God's people. And he says, you know, if you kill these guys, if you don't forgive them, 
might as well kill me too. I don't want to be a part of this. And God doesn't kill him. And God, you know, he said he was going to kill them, and he told Moses to leave them alone so he could burn in wrath. But Moses really stood up for the people. We need to point out that this is not the only time that this exact sequence of events happens to Israel through Moses. They're also trying to enter the promised land, and the people don't want to enter the promised land. And God also gets angry there. And God again wants to destroy all of Israel. And they're only saved through Moses' intervention again. Through Moses, we get this picture of God, whereas God wants righteousness. God wants a people. But God gets frustrated, and he gets frustrated when the people continually reject him. In spite of daily miracles in the wilderness, all these people are rejecting him in favor of other gods. They're not listening to him. They're not trusting him. And he had saved Israel from Egypt, and he had provided for them. He gave them food. He gave them water. And they're still rejecting him, and he does, he's, he gets fed up with this, and he gets angry about this. And it's only through his favorite person, Moses, that the people are saved. So after Israel finally enters the promised land, they set up a series of judges. And the judges could be understood as a cycle of rebellion and correction and rejection. And God says, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, every time that I save these guys, they just go back to being wicked. And not it's not even like positive that they're becoming less wicked than they are before. They're becoming more wicked as the cycle continues. And so God's salvations, God's promises, God's God saving the people, it's, it's not working out how God expects. Eventually the people, they clamor for a king. They want to be like all the other nations in the world. And God takes this as a personal rejection of him. He says, you know, they've not rejected you. And he's talking to Samuel. They, they've not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. And this is kind of their ultimate rebellion of ultimately rejecting God as their king. God finds what he believes is a good guy. There's a prophet by the name of Saul. And Saul is young and handsome and attractive. And God recruits Saul. But God soon regrets this decision as Saul too abandons God. And God says, you know, I regret. I am sorry that I made Saul king. And you see his reaction to his regret as he goes and he finds someone else to be king. God wishes he had not appointed Saul. So God finds an individual named David, and God says to David that he's going to give David an everlasting kingdom. And this everlasting kingdom was one that God really wanted to offer to Saul. He said to Saul, I would have given you an everlasting kingdom if you would have just listened to me. But you didn't. You didn't listen to me. So you're not going to get the everlasting kingdom. David turns out much better than Saul, although he does have his problems. God says, you're too bloodthirsty, so you're not able to make my temple. But in David, we see the clearest depiction of Jewish theology, especially in his psalms. We could understand King David's psalms as prayers to God. We see a lot of praises to God. We see a lot of cries for help. He says, listen to me, God. Listen to what I'm saying. All these righteous people are dying. You need to act. You need to move in. You need to do stuff. He says, I'm about to die. And then he gives reasons why God should come save him. He says, if I die, who's going to talk about you? Who's going to sing to you? Who's going to praise you? You know, save me so I could help you. It's a reasoned argument for God to move and act. And King David's, in his theology, God acts and God listens and God responds to prayers. It's not necessarily that God's currently controlling everything. It's not even that God's necessarily always acting. God can be spurred to response, and that's in response to prayers. And God would not have acted if those prayers had not been spoken. King David dies, Solomon takes over, and remember that King David was given an everlasting kingdom. You see some struggles with this between God and the next generation of rulers that, that are descending from David. You know, the, the kingdom is eternal, but there's warnings attached to that eternal kingdom, that that eternal kingdom might not actually be eternal based on the actions of the kings. The kings, if evil, can be dispossessed. And we actually see a partial dispossessing of the promise when the kingdom is split into. And this is an innovative solution. God had promised an eternal kingdom. God had promised to revoke that eternal kingdom if people rebelled. And now here's a partial it's not that the promise is being totally revoked, it's being partially revoked, but it's being partially fulfilled as well. So God's using innovation to kind of solve this promise. 
you see after this that the kingdom is split in two, and they go through a series and of primarily bad kings until the Syrian and the Babylonian captivities. The Babylonians take over Judah, and the Syrians capture Israel, and the Syrians, their captivity is never heard from again. They never get returned. There is a promise in one of the prophets that they would get returned, but... Uh, you know, pretty much that was never fulfilled, and some Christians still think that's going to be fulfilled in the future. About this time, the Jews start incorporating this idea that there's going to be a coming kingdom of God, where God's going to return to earth and right all the wrongs. They've been oppressed, they've been abused, they've been abandoned, but now God's going to return. There's only this remnant left, and God's going to fulfill his promises to Israel, his promises to Abraham, and God's going to establish this new kingdom. And from this, you get this eschatology of an apocalypse, that there's going to be a day of judgment where God is going to judge the world. And what God's going to do there is he's going to take Israel and set them up as a kingdom over all the world. And the Gentiles are going to not only somewhat be incorporated into Israel, but they're also going to bring tribute to Israel. So Israel returns to the promised land and they rebuild the temple. And the temple's not as grand as the previous temple. And so the Jewish idea is now that they rebuilt the temple, God is going to return to the temple and inhabit it and, and really make them a priest nation to the rest of the world. They go through a series of captivities. You have the Maccabean revolts against one of the captivities. And then you have the Roman occupation of the Holy Land. And about the time of Jesus, they are really looking for this Messiah figure, this Jew from the tribe of David, through David's lineage, fulfilling the Davidic promises of an eternal kingdom. And he was really going to restore Israel's place in the world. But they actually don't get this. They don't get this Messiah figure that's a warlord who's going to overthrow the Romans. Instead, they get Jesus. And Jesus claims to be uh, the Messiah. And he claims to represent a coming kingdom of God. And to his disciples, he claims to be divine. He claims to be perhaps the second person of the Yahweh. And we see this kind of dualistic concept of Yahweh through the Old Testament. You see it in the story of Sodom where there's two Yahwehs. And you see it in various throne room situations where you got a spirit Yahweh and Yahweh proper. And you also see it in the Exodus text about Mount Sinai. But this isn't Jesus' primary ministry. Instead, Jesus' primary ministry was that the kingdom of God is coming. And it's, this kingdom of God fits in line with the Jewish eschatology, where God is going to rule on earth, and all the Gentile nations are going to bring their tribute. You know, this very Old Testament idea that the kingdom of God is coming, so everyone needs to reform their actions so that they can fit in and enter the kingdom of God when it does come. Jesus preaches about God, and he equates himself with God. He says, me and the Father, we are one. And Jesus' idea of God is that he could petition God, and he could talk to God, and God's going to be responsive to him, and God could even change the future. When Jesus is approached by, you know, the Jewish authorities, and they're going to arrest him, he says, you know, could I not just pray right now and get a legion of angels? I could do that if I want, because I could talk to God, and God is going to save me. And he's even going to save me from you guys trying to kill me on the cross if I ask. Jesus repeats the same theme in his prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Lord, you know, let this cup pass from me. I really don't want to die. I don't want to do it. So if there's another way, let's try to do that. But if not, you know, I really want to please you and do what you want. So not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is subjecting himself to God. And Jesus is under the impression that if Jesus doesn't do that, if Jesus was just really strong-headed, he could just forego the crucifixion if he so wanted. So Jesus is not a fatalist. And we read in Josephus that the Pharisees were primarily fatalists. So the Pharisees do approach Jesus and ask him about fatalism. They say, what about that tower of Shalom? And it went and it fell and it crushed a bunch of people. And Jesus' response to them is, you know, these guys weren't the most wicked people. There's no such thing as fate. But let the, let's take that and let's use that as an illustration to warn you guys. Either you guys are going to repent or the exact same thing is going to happen to you when God returns and punishes the wicked. So Jesus is killed. Jesus rises again. And Christianity is really the movement that occurred after Jesus' death. 
Jesus' death served as an atoning sacrifice. Like the Jews would bring sacrifices to Jerusalem to atone for their sins. They'd kill this animal and their sins would be absolved. Now Jesus acts as that for all Christians. And through Jesus' death, all Christians can gain this atonement. So what we get from the story of the Bible is this picture of God. And God genuinely desires a love relationship with man. Man is his creation, his ultimate creation, made in his image. And God really wants to commune with man. But mankind continually rejects God to the, the point of stressing God and, and making God regret God's action. And God becomes jaded by man. He says, you know, I would kill these guys under normal circumstances, but these guys are just way too evil, and so I'm lowering my standards for him. And the Bible is a story of God's attempt to reclaim his commune with man. And he tries to do this through various methods. You see his struggles as he tries to get Israel to conform to become a priest nation so that he can reach the rest of the world. And you see after the New Testament and Paul, where God ultimately decides to graft in the Gentiles into his chosen people, because the Jews just keep continually rejecting him. God is trying out new things. God's trying to make his plans work. And God's not afraid to admit that there's things that happen that he does not expect. God's really not concerned about knowledge. You don't find these little treatises on God's knowledge and, you know, all the metaphysical attributes of God. You find a story about God and God's actions and how God reacts and how God responds and how God deals with changing circumstances. And it's always in this innovative sense where God's acting and reacting and changing his plans and, and having people repent and come back to him and punishing people who don't repent. It's not this Greek idea of God where God is in some sort of eternal, timeless uh, existence. Instead, the God of the Bible is very dynamic. You see a lot of attributes come out in his various stories. He shows mercy on occasion. He shows justice on occasion. You see some loving acts. You see some acts of vengeance and retribution. Sometimes he says, you know, I'm going to satisfy my wrath against the people. And God explains, and God explains in the parable of the potter. And it's funny because Calvinists always turn to that as some sort of you know, proof text where God forces everyone to be a certain way. But in the text, it explains the text. And God says, you know, if some, someone turns from what they were doing, if an evil nation becomes good, I'm not going to destroy them. Even though I thought I was going to destroy them, even though I said I was going to destroy them, I'm not going to destroy them. And if there is a good nation and that becomes evil, you know, even though I said I might bless that nation, I'm going to change my mind. I might have said it, I might have thought it, and it uses both of those words in both of the contexts. It's crystal clear that God's going to change in relation to man, and God is really open to the future. The future doesn't exist where God knows what man's going to do. And so God will say something, God will think something, but God will change his mind when the circumstances change. God's primary obsession is not this uh, like uh, this worship or this this glory to him that the Calvinists are obsessed with where everything's happening to the glory of God but God really wants a relationship with mankind and all his actions and all his activities are geared towards that singular goal in the Bible even in his selection of the Jews as a chosen people, you get a sense that he holds them to a higher standard because he's turning them into a priest nation to reach the rest of the world, to bring all the world to him. Again, Paul says that didn't work out, and God had to turn to the Gentiles as a last-ditch resort. So what we get from the God of the Bible, the God of Jewish theology, is he's very personal, he's very relational, he changes to events, he innovates, He's loving at times. He, he performs justice at times. You, you could influence him. He listens to people and he values people. And he really considers our input when he makes decisions. He could be reached by our prayers. And he does respond to even pagan people like the pagan king Abimelech. He responds to him. God is not a thing. God is not an object that's floating in space. God's not pure actuality as the pagans would say. But God is a person. God has feelings, God has thoughts, God has emotions, and those emotions dictate how God acts in response to situations. And that's the God of the Bible, that's the God of Jewish theology, and that's the God of biblical open theism. If you have questions or comments, you could either post directly on this podcast on the God is Open page, or you could start up a thread under the God is Open companion page for this podcast. I thank you for listening, and have a great day. I was made to find you. I was made just for you, man.